Franklin Delano Road. Okay. And uh, every time I'd say, no, wasn't that where Again. Mr. Roosevelt did so? See, yes, and that's where I... Uh, <laughs> I know, oh, I know, it's a terrible... <laughs> Just right. Okay, we'll go in 10 seconds from now. <clears throat> Mr. President, this morning Governor Wallace moved in Alabama to prevent uh, a federally ordered integration of the first public school to be integrated in Alabama. Let's put state police around the school, as we've heard. Uh, do you intend any federal reaction to that instantly? Well, we've been in touch with the school board. It was the school board that uh, carried out the court order to provide for a integration of the schools. There had been order, so in a sense, the governor's action comes, I think, as some surprise to the local community. This matter will then, of course, be taken back to the federal court, who will then make a judgment as to what uh, action should be taken, and then it will be up to the school board to implement uh, that court decision. And, of course, this is a matter, because it is a federal court, in which the federal government will have a responsibility. You don't I'm hopeful it can be worked out by the people there. That's our ambition. But this is a matter for the federal court to determine and for the United States to implement. In other words, you don't intend any immediate action to get those students into school today or tomorrow? I think we are checking now to see what the uh, local school board is going to do. I should think by the end of the day... Uh, we'll know whether the school board's going to take the matter to the court. If they don't take the matter to the court, then, of course, uh, a responsibility will fall upon the Department of Justice. Do you have any idea what the Department of Justice could do in this particular circumstance? They could take the matter to the federal court. The federal court would then issue an order, which would uh, be up to them. If they issued an order compelling the schools to open, then the order would have to be carried out. We would hope it would be carried out by the local school board and that the governor would permit the federal court order to be implemented. We'll have to see that over the next days. Mr. President... I uh, don't like having to intervene in these matters. This should be settled by a local authority. It was being settled by them. And uh, I think that's the way it ought to be settled. On the other hand, of course, we have a constitutional responsibility. Mr. President, uh, with the... Tuskegee action today and a riot in Plaquemine Parish last night in Louisiana. I'm wondering if uh, it seems to indicate that perhaps Senator Stennis was right and that the what looked like the very successful march on Washington last week has instead got the South's back up and, uh, and solidified them in their resistance. You know, there's been difficulties in the North, too, this week, uh, this last week, so that uh, this is a continuing problem. The march was an episode, an important one, because I think it uh, was an impressive uh, manifestation of the strong desire of a good many responsible citizens for equal treatment. But this problem has been with us uh, for a hundred years and even before, and it was going to be with us uh, for a good many months and years to come. The Negroes are 10 percent of our population. To bring them into a full life in the American society with all that that means is going to be a long job and you're going to have difficulties in various states north and south east and west but they are here they are given the promises of the Constitution and uh, we have to do what we can to see that those promises are carried out that's the responsibility it seems to me of this generation of Americans north and south east and west even though it presents us with a good deal a good many harassments how seriously do you think this civil rights situation is going to affect your chances, assuming you'll be the nominee of the Democratic Party next year, in 1964? Well, obviously it's going to be a uh, important uh, matter. It's caused a good deal of feeling, I suppose, against the administration in the South. I suppose also, I suppose, in other parts of the country. Whenever you have a issue upon which people feel so strongly, uh, it quite obviously has its political effects, so I would say it would be an important matter. On the other hand, I'm hopeful that uh, both parties, Republicans and Democrats, will uh, commit themselves to the same objective of equality of opportunity. I would be uh, surprised if, if the Republican Party, which after all is uh, the party of Lincoln, and uh, is proud of that fact, as it should be, I would be surprised if they did not uh, also uh, support the right of every citizen to have equal opportunity, equal chance. 
under the Constitution. No sense in blaming it, of course, on Washington. And that's a convenient place to blame it, and I suppose that's one of the reasons why we're there. But this is a problem which goes into every community across the country, every family, and everyone has to make a decision. It's going to take time. I think it's finally going to be done, but we're trying to do something much more difficult than any other community country's ever done. A good many of the people who advise us so generously abroad have no comprehension of what a difficult task it is that faces the American people in the 60s. But I think that the United States government, I believe both parties, and I think the great mass of opinion is in favor of making progress along these lines. And, of course, the most important area is finally going to be education, which ties into jobs. You have education, equality of education, educational opportunity, and you find, I think, gradually equality in employment, and then you find the great uh, hump of the hill over past. Do you think you'll lose some southern states in 64? Well, I lost some in 60, so I suppose I'll lose some, uh, maybe more in 64. I don't know. It's too early to tell, but I would think we were I'm not sure that uh, I'm the most popular political figure in the country today in the South, but that's all right. I think that we'll have to wait and see a year and a half from now. Well, it's a year now. <laughs> not that long. You making any uh, estimate as to who your opponent might be in 64? No, there's a good many of them. A good many of them. Got any choices of who you'd like to run against? Either no, to put the issue no, before the people no. or otherwise? That's a great mistake. I know some Republicans chose me in 60 for their favorite candidate, but uh, so I know you know, I can choose anybody. I'll let them choose. Problems will become a little different when, of course, the Republicans have finally chosen a candidate who has to run north, south, east, and west, stand on a platform of the Republican Party. And it seems to me we'll have a clearer alternative. What do you think the issues might be in 64? Well, of course, abroad will be the security of the United States, uh, our efforts to uh, maintain that security, to uh, maintain the cause of freedom. I at home, I think it's going to be the economy, the state of the economy, jobs, opportunity for all Americans, uh, what we've done in the field of education, what we've done in the field of uh, resource development, conservation, all the rest. I would say the vigor of the American economy and the American society at home Security of the United States abroad. Mr. President, this, after all, is Labor Day, and there are almost five million Americans who don't have very much to celebrate this Labor Day. It's another day of unemployment for them. Uh, do you see any real hope in a booming economy where we still have to have this many unemployed that in the next, say, five years, a second term for you, for instance, there, we can find a solution to this problem? Well, there's no magic solution that uh, suddenly is going to emerge. What it is, it seems to me, a combination of action, which we're trying to take. What we have to realize is to even stand still, uh, stay still, we have to move very fast. We have two and a half million more people working than when I came to office, and yet uh, a million and a half more people have come into the labor market. Now, this is going to be made even more difficult because in the next two and a half years, we're going to have about five and a half million people come to the labor market searching for jobs, and about uh, two and a half million of those won't have finished high school. So this is very difficult. When you talk about the unemployed, and that's statistic, you first realize there are almost 70 million Americans working, and uh, we're steadily increasing their prosperity. But there are this very hard core of unemployed. Some of them are in the old coal areas, which where they don't need those people uh, now, and yet uh, so they can't find work and they're older. The Appalachian region particularly, eastern Kentucky, West Virginia, parts of Pennsylvania, parts of Indiana, parts of Ohio, southern Illinois. Then there's the steel unemployment in the big cities, Pittsburgh, Youngstown, Gary. It's very difficult uh, to uh, find work uh, for them. Then we have the combination of the older workers who have been thrown out of work because of technology, and then we have the younger people coming in, many of whom are uneducated. Now, 50 years ago, they could have either been a job on the farm or they could have been doing manual labor. Machines are taking the place of manual labor, and we are steadily, people are steadily moving off the farms because we're producing so much. The answer, it seems to me, lies in a whole variety of programs. The tax cut, I think, is most important. That would be an $11 billion tax cut in a period of 18 months. We're not doing this... Uh, just because, uh, though, of course, everybody would like to have their taxes reduced, but the major reason is because of the lift it will give the economy, the assurance it will give us against another recession. $11 million 
in the economy multiplies, it's spent, and will bring an increase of nearly $30 billion, 30 to $35 billion. This can, I think, be the most single most important step. In those areas where there is chronic unemployment, I think vocational education, aid to education so that these children will stay in the schools, and this is something that every parent can do. Any boy or girl who leaves school before they finished uh, are going to have a hard time in this world of ours in the next 10 or 20 years. And area redevelopment, those programs which put a special emphasis on areas of chronic unemployment. Uh, these youth employments, so particularly these boys, 17 or 18, are out of school and out of work, so we can take them and let them work as they did in the 30s in the CCC in these forests. These are the kind of things, retraining, particularly for the older men, job retraining program. Therefore, I hope Congress will enact this kind of legislation. So in answer to your question, I believe that with the combination of the tax cut plus these other programs, we can reduce that unemployment from the 5.5%. Most importantly, we can prevent it from being increased, and I think we can get it under 5% in the period of two years, two and a half years. We can't do it by just saying uh, it'll be done on its own. Too many people are coming in the labor market, too many machines are throwing people out. Mr. President, speaking of Congress, the, uh, the uh, Adam test ban treaty comes up to the Senate next uh, few days, and everybody's predicting, uh, as I believe you are, that it's going to pass by a very good majority. But uh, as all of the argument about it, discussion about it, and even suggestions from high places, including former President Eisenhower, a reservation on, on the treaty, do you think that, that this has hurt the spirit that prevailed in getting this treaty in the first place? No, if the, if the treaty is so it's not substantial enough to stand uh, discussion and debate, then of course it isn't a very good treaty. So I don't. Uh, I think what would be most desirable is after all this discussion and debate, then to get a very strong vote in the Senate. I think a reservation would be a great mistake. I don't think President Eisenhower used the reservation in the formal sense that he wanted the Senate of the United States to put a reservation on the treaty, because that would mean that the treaty would have to be renegotiated. He was concerned that uh, we would uh, make it very clear that uh, we had the right to use nuclear weapons in time of war. Well, of course, we do have that right. We've stated it. The committee report of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee will restate it. So I think that that will deal with the problem that concerned him. Otherwise, I think a reservation, would, uh, which would require us to renegotiate the treaty with nearly 100 countries, in my opinion, would be, uh, be better to defeat the treaty. Mr. President, the only hot war we've got running at the moment of, is, of course, the one in Vietnam. Uh, and we've got our difficulties there, quite obviously. Uh, the headline and the story in the New York Times yesterday morning was rather an interesting one. It said that uh, the administration will try diplomacy in Vietnam, which uh, I'd assume we've been trying all along. Uh, what can we do in this situation, which uh, seems to parallel other uh, famous debacles of uh, dealing with unpopular governments in the past? Well, in the first place, we ought to realize that Vietnam has been at war for 25 years, and uh, the Japanese... years. I remember a good many uh, people who said uh, two years ago that it wouldn't last six months. A good many uh, newspapers said that. Uh, a good many local correspondents said it. Well, it's still... the war is still going. In many ways, it's going better. That doesn't mean, however, that the events of the last two months aren't very ominous. I don't think that uh, unless a greater effort is made by the government to win popular support, they, that the war can be won out there. In the final analysis, it's their war. They're the ones who have to win it or lose it. We can help them. We can give them equipment. We can send our men out there as advisors, but they have to win it, the people of Vietnam, against the communists. We're prepared to continue to assist them, but I don't think that the war can be won unless the people support the effort. And in my opinion, in the last two months, the government has gotten out of touch with the people. The repressions against the Buddhists, uh, we felt, were very unwise. Now, uh, all we can do is to make it very clear that we don't think this is the way to win. I, it's my hope that this will become increasingly obvious to the government, that they will take steps to try to bring back popular support for this very essential struggle. But these people who say that uh, we ought to withdraw from Vietnam are wholly wrong, because if we withdrew from Vietnam, the communists would control Vietnam. Pretty soon, Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, Malaya would go, and all of Southeast Asia would be under the control of the communists and under the domination of the Chinese. And then India, Burma would be the next target. So I think we should stay. We should make it clear, as Ambassador Lodge is now making it clear, 
that while we want to help, we don't see a successful ending to this war unless the people will support it. And the people will not support the effort if uh, the government continues to follow the policy of the past two months. I hope that will be clear to the government. It should be. After all, they've been conducting this struggle for ten years, and uh, I admire what the president has done. He's been counted out a number of times. I'm hopeful that he will come to see that uh, they have to reestablish their relationship. Do you but think we ought to remember that they're the ones who are dying by the thousands, and uh, they're the ones who have to win this war, or they're the ones who will lose it. We can't do either. We can assist them to win it, and we can warn them against losing it. But the United States is not the... We don't have troops in the in mass who are dying by the thousands, and uh, uh, we do the best we can to make it clear what policy they should follow, but they have to decide it. Do you think that uh, this government still has time to uh, to yeah, regain the I support do. of the people with changes uh, in policy and uh, perhaps with uh, in personnel? I think it can. If it doesn't uh, make those changes. I would think that the chances of winning it would not be very good. Well, hasn't every indication from uh, Saigon been that uh, President Jim has no intention of changing his pattern? If he doesn't change it, uh, of course, that's his decision. He's been there ten years, and as I say, he has carried this burden uh, when he's been counted out on a number of occasions. Our best judgment is that he can't be successful on this basis. We hope that he comes to see that. But in the final analysis, it's the people and the government themselves who have to win or lose this struggle. All we can do is help. And we're making it very clear. But I don't agree with those who say we should withdraw. That'd be a great mistake. That'd be a great mistake. I know people don't like Americans to be engaged in this kind of an effort. Forty-seven Americans have been killed in combat with the enemy. Uh, but uh, this is a very important to struggle, even though it's far away. We took all this, made this effort to defend Europe. Now Europe is quite secure. We also have to participate, we might not like it, in the defense of Asia. We're in a very uh, desperate struggle against the communist system. And uh, I don't want Asia to pass into the control of the Chinese. I would think that would threaten the security, not right today, but uh, in the 1970s, the late 60s. That would substantially increase our problem, increase the danger to India, which is 500 million people. And uh, if that would join with the rest of the communist bloc, uh, they'd be that much nearer to us. Mr. President, have you made an assessment as to what President de Gaulle was up to in his statement on Vietnam last week? No, I guess it was an expression of his uh, general view, but uh, uh, he doesn't uh, have any forces there or any program of economic assistance so that, uh, well, these expressions are welcome, but the burden is carried, as it usually is, by the United States and the people there. But uh, I think anything General de Gaulle says should be listened to, and we listen. You don't think that uh, this is another... Uh, prod to get together with you to try to call off President de Gaulle from his kind of uh, sniping at us? Well, I mean, President de Gaulle follows a policy of, what, of advancing the interests of France, and uh, that's uh, and he's a man of uh, great stature. We're trying to advance the interests of the United States, and we think the interests of the United States are tied up with maintaining the balance of freedom in the world. What, of course, makes Americans somewhat impatient is that after carrying this load for 18 years, we're going to have to get counsel. But uh, we would like uh, a little more assistance, real assistance. But uh, we're going to meet our responsibility anyway. It doesn't do us any good to say, well, uh, why don't we all just go home and leave the world to those who are our enemies. General de Gaulle's not our enemy. He's our friend and candid friend, and they're sometimes difficult, but uh, he's not uh, the object of our hostility. Mr. President, uh, the uh, uh, sending of Henry Cabot Lodge, who, after all, has been a political uh, enemy of yours over the years, one point or another in your career, and his, uh, uh, sending him out to Saigon might raise some speculation that perhaps you're trying to uh, keep this from being a political issue in 1964. No, I, you know, uh, Ambassador Lodge wanted to go out to uh, Saigon. Uh, if he were as careful as uh, some politicians are, of course he wouldn't have wanted to go there. He would have maybe liked some very safe job. But he's energetic, and he has strong feelings about the United States. And surprisingly, as it seemed, he put this ahead of his political career. Uh, sometimes politicians do those things, Walter. Thank you very much, and, Mr. President. Uh, we're fortunate to have him. Thank you, sir.
How many minutes do we do? We can cut out a little of those that stuff in the economy. Does that have to go all right from your standpoint? Yeah, that was fine. Uh, maybe just a little longer the answer than. So I don't mind if they decide to edit any of this stuff. Yeah, we'll probably have to do some, some to get it in. Yeah. We've got a helicopter standby at LaGuardia to get in to avoid the labor day crunch. Hey, pardon? The time I spent? No, the uh, cost. The actual cost. Oh, gosh. Uh, you, you, you mean of, uh, of of this shooting or of our whole program? Oh, we figure, I, I think, uh, roughly $50,000 a day. Oh, do you want me? Are you well, actually, what we do is we're getting some cover shots for this time. Okay. Uh -huh. Get your long lens on that sunfish out there, and we can all have one for Christmas. <laughs> I've got one of those up on a little lake up in Carmel, New York, where we go. Yeah, they're a lot of fun. A little, little surfing board there. Thank you very much. Yeah, fine. Yeah,